Hi, I'm Rashonda Cade. This is Reading with Rashonda, and we're reading Our Nig by Harriet E. Wilson. We are on chapter six, entitled Varieties. Harder life's early steps, and but that youth is buoyant, confident, and strong in hope, men would behold its threshold and despair. Yeah. The sorrow of Freda was very great, for her pet and Mr. Belmont, by great exertion, obtained it again, much to the relief of the child. To be thus deprived of all her sources of pleasure was a sure way to exalt their worth, and Fido became, in her estimation, a more valuable presence than the human beings who surrounded her. James had now been married a number of years, and frequent requests for a visit from the family were at last accepted, and Mrs. Belmont made great preparations for a fall sojourn in Baltimore. Mary was installed housekeeper, in name merely, for Nig was the only moving power in the house. Although suffering from their joint severity, she felt safer than to be thrown wholly upon an ardent, passionate, unrestrained young lady whom she always hated <clears throat> and felt it hard to be obliged to obey. The trial the trial she must meet. Were Jack or Jane at home, she would have some refuge. Only one remained. Good Aunt Abby was still in the house. She saw the fast receding coach which conveyed her master and mistress with regret and begged for one favor only, that James would send for her when they returned, a hope she had confidently cherished all these five years. She was now able to do all the washing, ironing, baking, and the common etc. of household duties, though but fourteen, Mary left all for her to do, though she affected great responsibility. She would show herself in the kitchen long enough to relieve herself of some command better withheld, or insist upon some compliance to her wishes in some department which she was very imperfectly acquainted with, very much less than the person she was addressing, and so impetuous till her orders were obeyed that to escape the turmoil, Nig would often go contrary to her own knowledge to gain respite. Nig was taken sick. What could be done? The work, certainly, but not by Miss Mary. So Nig would work while she could remain erect, then sink down upon the floor or a chair till she could rally for a fresh effort. Mary would look in upon her, chide her for her laziness, threaten to tell mother when she came home, and so forth. Nig! screamed Mary one of her sickest days. Come here and sweep these threads from the carpet. She attempted to drag her weary limbs along, using the broom as support. Impatient of delay, she called again, but with a different request. Bring me some wood, you lazy jade, quick! <sighs> Nig rested the broom against the wall and started on the fresh beshet. I'm sorry. And started on the fresh behest. Too long gone. Flushed with anger, she rose and greeted her with, What are you gone so long for? Bring it in quick, I say. I am coming as quick as I can, she replied, entering the door. Saucy, impudent nigger you, is this the way you answer me? And taking a large carving knife from the table, she hurled it in her rage at the defenseless girl. Dodging quickly, it fastened in the ceiling a few inches from where she stood. There rushed on Mary's mental vision a picture of bloodshed in which she was the perpetrator and the sad consequences of what was so nearly an actual occurrence. Tell anybody of this if you dare. If you tell Aunt Abby, I'll certainly kill you, she said, terrified. She returned to her room, brushed her threads herself, was for a day or two more guarded, and so escaped deserved and merited penalty. Oh, how long the week seemed which held Nig in subjection to Mary. But they passed like all earth's sorrows and joys. Mr. and Mrs. B. returned, delighted with their visit, and laden with rich presents for Mary. No word of hope for Nig. James was quite unwell and would come home the next spring for a visit. This, thought Nig, will be my time of release. I shall go back with him. From early dawn until after all were retired, was she toiling, overworked, disheartened, longing for relief. Exposure from heat to cold or the reverse often destroyed her health for short intervals. She wore no shoes until after frost, and snow even appeared, and bared her feet again before the last vestige of winter disappeared. These sudden changes she was so illy guarded against nearly conquered her physical symptom, system. Any word of complaint was severely repulsed or cruelly punished. She's only allowed to wear shoes in winter, in the bitterest of winter, 
after the snow has fallen and before the snow has melted is the only time she's allowed to wear shoes. It's just a book. It's just a book. But books, I love literature. Books reflect and also create um, the societies that they talk about. I love the power of narrative. Um, I'll keep reading. I'll keep reading. She was told she had much more than she deserved, so that manual labor was not in reality her only burden. But such an incessant torrent of scolding and boxing and threatening was enough to deter one of maturer years from remaining within sound of the strife. It is impossible to give an impression of the manifest enjoyment of Mrs. B in these kitchen scenes. It was her favorite exercise to enter the apartment noisily, vociferate orders, give a few sudden blows to quicken Nig's pace, then return to the sitting room with such a satisfied expression, congratulating herself upon her thorough housekeeping qualities. Her thorough housekeeping qualities? Oh my gosh. She usually rose in the morning at the ringing of the bell for breakfast. If she were heard stirring before that time, Nig knew well there was an extra amount of scolding to be borne. No one now stood between herself and Fredo, but on Abby, and if she dared to interfere in the least, she was ordered back to her own quarters. <sighs> Nig would creep slyly into her room, learn what she could of her regarding the absent, and thus gain some light in the thick gloom of care and toil and sorrow in which she was immersed. The first of spring, a letter came from James announcing his declining health. Oh no. He must try northern air as a restorative, so Fredo joyfully prepared for this agreeable increase of the family, this addition to her cares. He arrived feeble, lame from his disease, so changed Fredo wept at his appearance, fearing he would be removed from her forever. He kindly greeted her, took her to the parlor to see his wife and child, and said many things to kindle smiles on her sad face. Fredo felt so happy in his presence, so safe from maltreatment. He was to her a shelter. He observed silently the ways of the house a few days. Nick still took her meals in the same manner as formerly, having the same allowance of food. He one day bade her not remove the food, but sit down to the table and eat. Ooh. Ooh. Sit down to the table and eat? Ooh. Let's see what happens. She will, mother, he said calmly but imperatively. I'm determined. She works hard. I've watched her. Now, while I stay, she is going to sit down here and eat such food as we eat. Whew. A few sparks from the mother's black eyes were the only reply. She feared to oppose where she knew she could not prevail. So Nig's standing attitude and selected diet vanished. She no longer had to stand to eat and eat the whatever scrap she was eating. Ooh, but what's going to happen when James leaves, either by death or by will? Whew. Her clothing was yet poor and scanty. She was not blessed with a Sunday attire, for she was never permitted to attend church with her mistress. Religion was not meant for niggers, she said. When the husband and brothers were absent, she would drive Mrs. B and Mary there, then return and go for them at the close of the service, but never remain. Aunt Abby would take her to evening meetings held in the neighborhood, which Mrs. B never attended, and impart to her lessons of truth and grace as they walked to the place of prayer. Many of less piety would scorn to present so doleful a figure. Mrs. B had shaved her glossy ringlets, and in her coarse cloth gown and ancient bonnet, she was anything but an enticing object. But Aunt Abby looked within. She saw a soul to save, an immortality of happiness to secure. These evenings were eagerly anticipated by Nig. It was such a pleasant release from labor. I want to go back for a second, and I think this is really brilliant what Wilson did here. Um... Many of less piety would scorn to present so doleful a figure. Mrs. B had shaved her glossy ringlets, and in her coarse cloth gown and ancient bonnet, she was anything but an enticing object. So um, what we read in William Wells Brown's Clotel 
and what will you'll see in a lot of um, 19th century American literature is the idea of the beautiful mulatto. So mulatto is somebody who is um, mixed race, typically in these novels, half black, half white. And so here we have Fredo, who is indeed half black and half white. And if we ascribe the beauty of a mulatto to her, it's like, this long curly hair and somehow they end up in these fabulous clothes that fit them really nicely. I don't understand how it happens, but that's what it's like in the books. But in this paragraph, Mrs. B had shaved Fredo's glossy ringlets and she was dressed in a coarse cloth gown and ancient bonnet. She was anything but an enticing object. She's the exact opposite of what you expect of a mulatto slave woman. And her name is, I mean, her name is Fredo, but, and we refer to her as Nig. It is super easy between the name, how she is treated, and this description of her appearance to not think about her as this mulatto figure at all. But I'm pretty sure we're supposed to. We're supposed to have that underlying mulatto beauty ideal and then rest Fredo on top of that to create a, an uncomfortable tension for us as readers when we get the reality of what life as a slave might have been like versus kind of the glossy we might get in other things. I just, oh, I love that that happened in that paragraph. Okay, I'm going to keep reading. These evenings were eagerly anticipated by Nig. It was such a pleasant release from labor. Such perfect contrast in the melody and prayers of these good people to the harsh tones which fell on her ears during the day. Soon she had all their sacred songs at command and enlivened her toil by accompanying it with this melody. So she sang Christian songs while she worked. James encouraged his aunt in her efforts. She had found the savior. He wished to have Fredo's desolate heart gladdened, quieted, sustained by his presence. He felt sure there were elements in her heart which, transformed and purified by the gospel, would make her worthy the esteem and friendship of the world. I am all about people knowing Jesus and being saved. All about it. But even if you don't know Jesus, you are still worthy of the esteem and friendship of humanity. But I guess you aren't if you're a slave because you're not even a whole person per the U.S. Constitution. Mm. All right. Um. A kind, affectionate heart, native wit, and common sense, and the pertness she sometimes exhibited, he felt if restrained properly, might become useful in originating a self-reliance, which, which would be of service to her in after years. Okay, so as we all grow up, we all have habits, and when we're young, when we're old, that we need to rein in. Um, but what's wrong with having a kind, affectionate heart, native wit, and common sense? Well, maybe it was just the pertness that needed to be restrained. Okay, let me read that again. A kind, affectionate heart, native wit, and common sense, and the pertness she sometimes exhibited, he felt if restrained properly, might become useful in originating a self-reliance, which would be of service to her in after years. Okay, so he's just talking about the pertness she sometimes exhibits needs to be restrained properly. I can take that more readily. Um, pertness is never a particularly appealing character trait, but I will say, um, maybe she's not actually pert. I mean, she's a slave and she's doing her work. If she were free and she talked back to somebody, she would probably be called brave and she would be fighting for her freedom. Right. Um, I'm thinking of the American Revolution, the people who orchestrated that and fought in it are our national heroes, and they should be. 
But if they had lost, they would have been traitors and hanged or otherwise executed, drawn, and quartered. I'm not sure. Maybe all of the above. Um, it really depends on who's telling the story, what character traits are exhibited and what they're called. We would call their character traits the, um, the, the framers. We would call them brave and bold and insightful. I don't know if the English were calling them that at that time. Um, who is telling the story has a lot of influence over what story gets told. All right, I'll keep reading. I want to get to the end of this chapter and not take us too long. Yet it was not impossible to compass all this while she remained where she was. He wished to be cautious about pressing too closely her claims on his mother as it would increase the burdened one he so anxiously wished to relieve. He cheered her on with the hope of returning with his family when he recovered sufficiently. Ah, uh, that's kind of like a bait and switch. Woo, you can return with my family when I'm better. I don't know when I'm going to get better. Maybe I won't. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll call for you. Maybe I won't. Mm. I mean, I think his heart is in the right place. I'm getting kind of upset, though, at the whole idea of somebody needing a white savior. But um, in some circumstances, and a white male savior at that. In some circumstances, though, that is exactly what you need. You need somebody with the social power to be able to move forward. Okay, I'm, I'm going to keep reading. That's what I'm going to do. Nick seemed awakened to new hopes and aspirations and realized a longing for the future hitherto unknown. To complete Nick's enjoyment, Jack arrived unexpectedly. His greeting was as hearty to herself as to any of the family. Where are your curls, Frey? asked Jack after the usual salutation. Your mother cut them off. Thought you were getting handsome, did she? Same old story, is it? Knocks and bumps? Better times coming, never fear, Nig. How different this appellative sounded from him. He said it in such a tone, with such a roguish look. She laughed and replied that he had better take her west for a housekeeper. Jack was pleased with James's innovation of table discipline and would often tarry in the dining room to see Nig in her new place at the family table. As he was thus sitting one day after the family had finished dinner, Fredo seated herself in her mistress's chair and was just reaching for a clean dessert plate which was on the table when her mistress entered. Put that plate down. You shall not have a clean one. Eat from mine, continued she. Nig hesitated. To eat after James, his wife, or Jack would have been pleasant, but to be commanded to do what was disagreeable by her mistress because it was disagreeable was trying. <sighs> Quickly looking about, she took the plate, called Fido to wash it, <sighs> which he did to the best of his ability. Then wiping her knife and fork on the cloth, she proceeded to eat her dinner. Oh, okay. Oh, 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 snap. Oh my gosh. Oh. So Fredo was like, you know what? I would rather eat after a dog than eat after you. Oh. <laughs> Here, eat after me. And she was like, bet. Fido, lick this plate for me. I will eat after you. Okay, Woo! all right, Nig never looked toward her mistress during the process. She had Jack near, she did not fear her now. Insulted, full of rage, Mrs. Belmont rushed to her husband and commanded him to notice this insult, to whip that child. If he would not do it, James ought. James came to hear the kitchen version of the affair. Jack was boiling over with laughter. He related all the circumstances to James and pulling a bright silver half dollar from his pocket, he threw it at Nig saying, there, take that. 
was worth paying for. He was like, that's the best show I've ever seen. I would pay for that. Here, I will pay for that. He's probably like, somebody needed to take my mom down to pick. Oh, and you did. Uh. James saw his mother, told her he would not excuse or palliate Nig's impudence, but she should not be whipped or be punished at all. You have not treated her mother so as to gain her love. She is only exhibiting your remissness in this matter. She only smothered her resentment until a convenient opportunity offered. That's what I was worried about. She was gone. She's going to get back. Let's see what happens. The first time she was left alone, alone with Nig, she gave her a thorough beating to bring up arrearages and threatened if she ever exposed her to James, she would cut her tongue out. James found her upon his return sobbing, but fearful of revenge, she dared not answer his queries. He guessed their cause and longed for returning health to take her under his protection. I am surprised it wasn't worse than that. So that was chapter six. It was a rollicking ride there of Our Nig by Harriet Wilson. I'm Rashonda Cade, and this is Reading with Rashonda.